everyone. Today we're going to be talking on Candide or Optimism, a text by Voltaire, a French writer that was published in 1759. Um, I have with me today a guest speaker from the United States, from the University of Arkansas, uh, Professor M. Keith Booker, who is a really um, um, eminent uh, scholar and a really perspicacious um, uh, person uh, who has insights uh, when it comes to the different genres of literature, uh, film, and culture. And he will be discussing uh, today's text uh, with me. Uh, hello, uh, Professor Booker. Thank you for hello. being with me today. Hello, Professor Delisa. Um, so should we start with the model of uh, history? Uh, yes, thank okay. you. Uh, greetings to Dr. Derisa's students. I'm going to start out today because Dr. Derisa asked me to uh, prepare this for you. This basically is a little sketch of the Marxist model of history put into place by Karl Marx uh, in the course of the 19th century, but a model that really began to take shape in the late 18th century in the work of bourgeois historians such as Edward Gibbon, whose work The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire is generally considered to be the first truly modern work of history. Uh, in Gibbon's model, history begins with the classical period, the heyday of Greece and Rome, a uh, period dominated by uh, great cultural and philosophical uh, achievements. Gibbon then views the, the fall of the Roman Empire as a kind of descent into darkness, so that the next period in history, the medieval period, is often referred to as the Dark Ages. The Gibbon's important because his model of history was a, a big influence on Marx, but it's, it's also important for today's lecture because Gibbon uh, himself was highly influenced by Voltaire in developing his model uh, of the uh, decline and fall of the Roman Empire. In particular, Voltaire was very uh, much opposed to organized religions and especially the Catholic Church. Uh, and of course, the fall of the Roman Empire was concurrent with the rise of the Catholic Church. And so Voltaire viewed uh, the coming of Christianity as a sort of coming of darkness uh, and as a, a decline for European civilization. Uh, and, and then the Catholic Church remains uh, the main ideological force in Europe for the next thousand years of the so-called Dark Ages, uh, leading eventually to the Renaissance or rebirth. Again, this is a, a model developed by historians in the 19th century, basically to designed to make the modern world look good. Mm -hmm. uh, so Renaissance means rebirth, and it's called rebirth because uh, this period was envisioned as a kind of uh, time when the uh, glories of Greece and Rome were finally returning to European civilization. After the Renaissance, then, we lead into the modern period in which we still live today. Mm -hmm. This was the period of the rise of capitalism as the dominant economic force in the West, uh, and especially the first part of the modern period was referred to as the Enlightenment. That is, again, as opposed to the Dark Ages, this is now a time of the coming of light, uh, removal of the darkness, uh, a, a rise of rationality and science as ways of solving and approaching problems as opposed to uh, religious thinking. Uh, and that's pretty much for bourgeois historians, that's sort of the end of history, that presumably capitalism will remain in place forever and will stay in this mode of history forever. In Marx's model, of course, capitalism will eventually fall uh, due to a proletarian revolution, leading, hopefully, if, if people play their cards right, uh, to an era of socialism. Though, again, with Marx, nothing is guaranteed with history. Men make their own history, uh, though not under conditions of their own choosing. So depending on what people do, history can go various different ways. Uh, he hopes it goes towards socialism, but that is by no means guaranteed. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Professor Booker. And we're going to see how um, the Enlightenment uh, uh, period is a, a big uh, part of the 18th uh, century um, uh, thinking and uh, philosophies of uh, basically various uh, writers and thinkers of the time. So uh, Voltaire, uh, who was born in 1694 and died in 1778, is considered a key 
18th century uh, satirist and one of the writers who most vividly expressed the ideals of the Enlightenment period that Professor Booker just um, uh, talked about. So that period um, uh, when the rationalist ideals of modernity, like Professor Booker said, first became dominant in Western Europe, uh, um, Voltaire was imprisoned in the Bastille. Uh, the Bastille is a famous French prison that was demolished on the eve of the French Revolution in 1789. Uh, he lived much of his life in exile because of uh, his ideas and the way he thought and his criticisms of the French, the French regime. Uh, his body was transferred to the, uh, 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 back to France in 1791, honoring him as one of the great forerunners of uh, the French Revolution. Uh, would you like to add um, on that, Professor Booker? Uh, well, I might just point out that Voltaire, while being an incredibly important figure, was always at odds with authority mm -hmm. uh, in France in the 18th century. So the reason his body had to be transferred to the Pantheon in 1791 was that when he first died, uh, he was denied the right to be buried in sacred ground because of his criticisms of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And so his body was actually buried secretly uh, by some of his supporters. Uh, and then it was removed to an official uh, tomb in 1791. Yeah, and here is Voltaire. Here is a picture of Voltaire, who is considered uh, one of the great minds of the 18th uh, century. Here are um, a list of uh, his major works that expressed his the ideas of the Enlightenment, uh, and Candide is one of these uh, works. Uh. Uh, of course. So uh, Candide is also considered a, world of, uh, a work, a text of world literature that remains relevant uh, um, uh, up to this day. And the 1956 musical stage adaptation has uh, been revived um, uh, several uh, times. We're going to comment on the uh, Orientalism uh, that we see here in the uh, adaptation. Uh, should we do it now and when we get to Edward Said? Uh, I think we can wait till we get to Said. I might point out, though, that this uh -huh. stage adaptation was, uh, has been very successful. It's won lots of awards. It was written by Leonard Bernstein, who's one of the mm -hmm. most famous American composers. Yeah. So we will discuss the Orientalism of this adaptation uh, in, uh, in a little bit. So uh, Candide, the story, participates in multiple genres. So travel writing, utopian narratives, as in Thomas More's Utopia in 1516, and dystopian narratives in Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels in 1726, and realistic fiction. Why? Because it contains details, uh, descriptions of real world places where the action uh, is set and takes uh, place. Um, so, uh, do we, should we mention anything on travel writing, utopian narratives and dystopian narratives? Well, I think, uh, again, these, these were genres that were very prominent in the 18th century, and they, they sort of helped to place uh, Candide in its time period. Travel writing was particularly popular in the 18th century simply because people were traveling more than ever before and traveling mm -hmm. to places in the world uh, that had not been uh, documented in European literature uh, before. Uh, the Enlightenment itself also is informed by a lot of utopian ideas. The idea, one of the main principles of the Enlightenment is that uh, people are really capable and really smart and can understand the world, can take charge of the world, can change the world. And uh, generally, Enlightenment thinking is very optimistic and believes that people will, in fact, uh, build a better and better world until possibly uh, reaching a perfection in, in the the work of some thinkers, though not Voltaire. Voltaire would disagree with that uh, entirely. Mm -hmm. So the utopian narratives are are, are very much uh, uh, a uh, central kind of thinking in the Enlightenment, even though, as you see here with Thomas More's Utopia in 1516, uh, if they go back even before the Enlightenment period. And dystopian narratives basically just go hand in hand 
utopian narratives because dystopian narratives are simply to be utopian, but something went badly wrong. Uh, and uh, one of the best examples of that is Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels from the 18th century. Uh, and Swift's uh, work is work that's often discussed. I'll say a little bit more about that later. Uh, in conjunction with Voltaire, because Swift was another one of the 18th century's great satirists, okay. and of course, realistic fiction was uh, was uh, the do- became the dominant mode of writing in Europe by the end of the 18th century, largely because it expresses the worldview of the bourgeoisie that that new class of capitalist leaders uh, who rose to power and became the dominant uh, class in Europe in the 18th century. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, 18th century literature. Um, uh, the 18th century is an era known for the rise of the novel. Uh, mainly when we say the novel, we really are talking about the realist uh, novel. Candide has some characteristics of the novel, especially in um, um, And so, like I said, um, 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 Candide has a lot of the characteristics of a realist novel, but is closer to a fable or a parable in its form. Um, uh, so first and foremost, it is a work of satire. Um, it's a genre that was very prominent in the 18th century uh, when it was practiced by such British masters as Swift and uh, Alexander. Uh, Pope, would you like to comment on uh, satire as a genre, Professor Booker? Uh, well, I might just comment that uh, that uh, the status of Candide as a sort of fable or parable uh, goes hand in hand with its status as a work of satire. Fables and parables are little stories that are designed to teach a lesson. Uh, satires are also designed to teach a lesson, but whereas fables or parables are often designed for children, they tend to be sort of charming. Yeah. Uh, for example, like I always mention to my students the story of uh, the little boy who keeps abusing uh, some um, a cat and throws uh, stones at the cat, and then the cat attacks the little boy, and then he goes to his mom crying, and his mom doesn't defend him, and he says, you deserve this because this is what happens when you... Um, uh, you know, when you abuse the ones who are weaker than yourself, and so there, there are always consequences for that kind of behavior, right? Right. Uh, and satire, though, on the other hand, tends to be a little bit sharper uh, in mm -hmm. its criticism, and also maybe a little bit more negative in form. Uh, like fables may often teach a positive lesson, mm -hmm. uh, though the one you mentioned, I, I guess, is, is uh, more a negative lesson of what not to do, but often mm -hmm. they're a, a lesson about what you should do. Satire, on the other hand, is always critical of some target, so it generally presents some point of view that you disagree with, and then it attempts to undermine that point of view, often to the point of ridicule, and you'll see that in Candide, that there's a lot of sarcasm and a lot of uh, attempts to make uh, his targets, especially philosophical optimism just appear ridiculous yeah and uh, so basically really Voltaire does not present his perspective or his ideas it's that the satire the satire here works in mentioning the counter idea and the way that they think about um, you know the philosophy of optimism and just making it look and sound ridiculous and this is how you achieve your purpose by undermining that philosophy right right Okay, so the book's chief narrative uh, um, conceit signals its uh, 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 satirical intent. So the book is presented as a translation from a German original authored by one Dr. Ralph, who is uh, uh, obviously a fiction. This suggests to the reader that they should be on the lookout for information that is not what it seems. And we're going to discuss this and talk about it later in textualization and uh, how readers should not just take things, um, whatever they read at face, uh, at face value, because Dr. Ralph here, who is supposedly the narrator of this story and the writer of it actually, 
seems to be naive and innocent and so which suggests that he does not really understand the world all that well um so this is a point i think that voltaire's mm -hmm. readers would have understood uh, very easily because this was actually a common conceit in the 18th century many 18th century novels begin with a little statement in the beginning that claims that this is a true story that's being told by so and so uh, mm -hmm. person even though uh, it obviously is a fiction it so it's just it was a, a kind of convention of the 18th century to present fictional stories as if they were true stories uh, but again it was such a convention that everybody recognized what was going on and realized that they were reading fiction yeah and so since we're, we're already talking about uh, satire we know that Candide um, uh, depends extensively on the technique of literary irony uh, that um, uh, Voltaire employs throughout uh, the story so literary uh, irony is when you use a naive or a deluded hero or an unreliable narrator and we already have these two uh, whose view of the world differs widely from the true circumstances recognized by the author or the readers so uh, this story employs a deluded hero, the title character, Candide, uh, uh, and also we have the unreliable narr narrator who is Dr. Uh, Ralph. And a lot of the humor of Candide is derived from the ironic distance between the narrator's words and Voltaire's satirical attack on that society of uh, the time. So the philosophy of optimism, it was considered a widely held view in the 18th uh, century when a faith in new, um, uh, when a new faith in rationality and human ca capability like what Professor Booker was just talking about uh, in uh, about the age of the enlightenment and the 18th century being that age where everything um, uh, uh, is about reasoning and common sense and science. And so this uh, brought many to believe that the coming of a better world was inevitable. Now, but the coming of this new world is not going to be inevitable just because this is how things are supposed to go. It's because according to uh, the scientific inquiry and the way that Voltaire thinks, it's because it requires work. Isn't that correct, Professor Booker? Uh, so, that's absolutely correct. So I mean, the philosophy of optimism is obviously the main satirical target mm -hmm. uh, of Candide. Yeah. And so it's not inevitable in the way that it's just going to happen regardless. And so uh, centrally expressed in Alexander's Pope, uh, you know, whatever is, is right. And in the philosophy of the German uh, uh, Leibniz, Pangloss here in the story is the main spokesman for optimism and uh, is uh, a comic buffoon obviously if you're reading the story and um, you're getting to know the character of Pangloss we know that he's a comic buffoon who supports and calls that whole philosophy into question and this is exactly what uh, Professor Booker just highlighted is that this is a technique used by Voltaire to basically call the philosophy of optimism into question is where you're using people who clearly don't know what is going on and who clearly who, who's clearly um, the ideas that they have about the world around them is uh, questionable right right um It's probably worth pointing out here that the names of the characters are often very meaningful mm -hmm. uh, in Candide. Mm -hmm. So the, <clears throat> the name Pangloss, uh, literally in Latin that means like all tongues, mm -hmm. uh, which implies that basically he's just always talking. But it also implies that he's a sort of know-it-all. He thinks he knows everything. He's very pedantic. He's always expounding He always on all kinds like of pontificates. Issues. He's very much pon uh, pontificates on every topic. He has something to say about everything. But the fact is, he actually doesn't know anything or understand anything. Uh, so his name is actually very ironic. Yeah, that's very interesting. Alexander Pope, who lived from 1688 to 1744, also talked about um, the philosophy of optimism. And here's his picture. You can see it here. And if you go to your textbook, uh, you can also, on page 182, 
it discusses uh, the uh, idea of um, can you mention it what is his idea his main idea whatever is right hello the idea is that uh -huh. uh, whatever is is right mm -hmm. uh, as you just mentioned the the, the, the point being that uh, he expresses in his poetry the notion that uh, you look around you you see the world maybe it looks terrible uh, at the time but you just have to have faith that uh, whatever it is is what it was supposed to be because it was designed by God. So even if it's bad and it looks bad to you, it must be for a good reason that this is happening. And we're going to see this in like different encounters uh, that happens on uh, Candide's journey with Pangloss. A lot of um, horrific um, incidents that Candide encounters and he just says, this cannot be optimism. How can we accept that this world is a good place when things like this are happening? And Pangloss basically says that you just must believe that there is some good to this horrifying thing that you're seeing in front of you, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay, and Leibniz here uh, from 1646 to 1716 was a rationalist philosopher and uh, who believed in arguing positions forward from uh, fundamental assumptions, such as that God had already put in place an ideal uh, plan for human history that would ultimately be carried out. And um, maybe Professor Booker can tell us a little bit about his reasoning uh, that, it, that was called uh, a priori thinking and a posteriori thinking. Yeah, well, Voltaire's thinking, uh, as you note here on your slide, is a posteriori thinking, mm -hmm. which is basically the scientific uh, approach to problems. You actually uh, look at some event that's already happened and, and uh, gather data about it and then draw conclusions from your analysis of that data. Uh, whereas a priori thinking, you start with first principles and try to explain events by uh, making certain fundamental assumptions uh, about what drove those events in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, Leibniz's approach is fundamentally a religious uh, approach, whereas Voltaire's approach is fundamentally a scientific approach. I think this indicates the way in which Leibniz, even though he was a big believer in rationality and one of the philosophers who really contributed to the growth of the Enlightenment, he was not a fully Enlightenment thinker himself. He's a sort of transitional figure transitional uh, who's figure. still trying to reconcile rationalism uh, with religion. So, and his argument was that uh, there's no, there can't be any contradiction between those two because God created uh, the world and also created rationality, and so rationality has to be consistent uh, with religion. Uh, and so, even though Leibniz uh, made a lot of contributions in rational thinking and mathematics and that sort of thing, uh, his his thinking is still ultimately. Uh, rooted uh, in traditional religious thought that everything happens because God wants it to happen, basically. Yeah, Professor Booker is uh, right, because Leibniz was actually the co-inventor of calculus independently of Sir Isaac uh, Newton, and so he did participate into these uh, scientific fields, but again, his way of thinking was uh, really rooted um, in religion, and uh, this is this was not the way that Voltaire uh, Voltaire uh, thinks, right? It's absolutely the antithesis of the way Voltaire thinks, and that's one of the reasons why uh, his satire of the philosophy of optimism is so barbed, uh, because mm -hmm. for him it embodies uh, the bad consequences of religious thinking. Yeah. Okay, so Candide is a nasty attack on the philosophy of optimism. We've already discussed this and we know what that means. And it can be quite nasty in its attacks because satire often is, can be like really nasty. But the satire is aimed at more than just a particular school of philosophy, as we already mentioned. Um, attacks also on the moral dishonesty that Voltaire saw was infecting the society of the time and perhaps actually most societies. 
an attitude that avoids dealing with a problem that we have, the ugly truth that's there, and instead of dealing with it, we just tend to cover them up with more comfortable uh, lies. Uh, do you have any insight on this, Professor Booker? Well, I mean, I think it, it is important to recognize that Voltaire is not engaging in a, a simple philosophical argument with Leibniz. I mean, Voltaire's mm -hmm. concerned about the real world consequences of this kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. If you look around you and you see all these terrible things, but you say, well, that's just the way it's supposed to be. It's obviously going to work out okay in, uh, eventually in the end. So, uh, you know, if you think that way, that means you just don't feel that you have any responsibility to do anything to make things better. And so you won't do anything to make things better. And for Voltaire, that leads to a lot of the bad things in the world and a lot of suffering, uh, a lot of warfare, a lot of uh, all the bad things in the world. Uh, and also, it doesn't mean that you as a person have a full agency and control over the situation in your culture or in your, in your society. But it's like what Marx said, that men make their own histories or history, even if not under... Con um, conditions of their own choosing is it that's what he says exactly exactly and so um you it's still like if you just think that you have no responsibility and that it's all uh, you know up to faith faith and uh, god then you're really um you're you're really just basically saying i'm not responsible for what's happening Okay, now we get to the next slide um, on Cunagon, uh, Candide's beloved. Uh, she narrates chapter 8 in the text. Uh, the old woman narrates chapter 11 and 12, while Paquette narrates chapter, uh, chapter 34. So all of these women are clearly presented to us as victims in the society that Pangloss sees as so ideal clearly undermining his perspective. So while Pangloss is p pontificating and telling Can Candide all these things about the uh, best of all worlds and how ideal the society is and whatever is happening is the best for of, like, humanity and the best of people, uh, then we hear these tales of suffering that these women endure. And so that is like one of the chief purposes of Voltaire Voltaire in this uh, text is to present to you something that just goes against what is mainly presented and so undermining it, right? Yeah, and I think the tales told by this women are, are also a good illustration uh -huh. of why Voltaire chose the mode of satire for mm -hmm. his story. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, it's, it's, you know, the stories that they tell are so horrific Mm -hmm. uh, and there's so many atrocities that they've observed, that they've themselves suffered, and then they still just say, yeah, but it's all going to be okay. This is still a good world. I still have faith that things are, are working out the way that they should. And, you know, if he didn't make things so extreme, uh, you might actually uh, just admire them and say, wow, these women have so much strength and courage, and, uh, and it's amazing that they can keep going through all this. That's not what you're supposed to think. You're supposed to think these women are – are just stupid. They do not understand anything about what's going on because their minds basically are, are you know, are immersed in this immersed. Uh, philosophy of optimism, uh, and, and and that's very bad for them. Yeah, it's, it reminds me of there's a probably the greatest dramatist of the 20th century was a German dramatist by the name of Bertolt Brecht. Uh -huh. yeah, Brecht. Uh, and one of his most famous plays is a play called Mother Courage. Uh -huh. And basically, it's a story of a mother who has uh, a series of sons. Her first son goes off to war and gets killed. Then there's another war, so she sends her second son off to the war and he gets killed. There's another war, she sends her third son off to the war and gets killed. And she just keeps going no matter what. She just keeps doing the same thing and going on because she felt that it was the appropriate thing to do to send her sons off to war. And Brecht was always frustrated because a lot of people, partly just because they looked at the title of the play and they said, oh, Mother Courage. Well, Mother is a good thing. Courage is a good thing. Mother Courage must be a really admirable character, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people just admired her and said, wow, it's amazing that she sticks to her principles no matter what's happened. Uh, and, you know, Brecht's point was, no, she just never learns. Mm 
you know, because she's, her mind is just so stuck in this one mode of thinking that she can't adjust the way she thinks in the face of new evidence uh, that comes along. And so Brecht uh, meant for people to, uh, to be horrified by her stupidity at never learning, even from something as horrible as the death of your son. Uh, but uh, it, it really is uh, something that, that you have to be aware of as a writer is that it's always possible for readers who, you know, are themselves often immersed in ways of thinking. They're just going to assume that somebody called Mother Courage must be a, a positive character and they're going to sympathize with her and agree with her. Uh, and so Voltaire chooses this tactic of satire where it's, it's pretty much impossible to believe, to uh, to agree with these women uh, mm -hmm. when they say the world is an ideal place after the stories that they tell. Yeah, and so that's why they are presented as unreliable narrators. Uh, and then we look at their tales and their tales of spectacular suffering. And so it kind of like makes you uh, raise that question of like, what is wrong with them? Why do they think this way? Why do they accept that fate? And that no, you do not have to accept that as part of optimism and a part of fate and b like part of God's plan. Uh, isn't that correct? Correct. Yeah. So uh, in Cunningham's chapter, narrated in a flashback, it tells the story of her experience in Lisbon, um, giving Voltaire a choice uh, to portray the injustices suffered by women, Protestant, intellectuals, and Jews in Catholic uh, society, basically the minorities. Uh, so Kennegan's very name is a sort of uh, pun, and there is a whole note on names that you can uh, look at in your, uh, in your books. Uh, so her story features a corrupt Catholic cleric uh, who embodies Voltaire's negative opinion uh, of the church. And if you want to weigh on, um, on this, Professor Booker, on Volta Voltaire's negative opinion uh, of the church at the time. Well, it's important to know that the Catholic church was still very powerful uh, in France at the time. It was the dominant uh, intellectual and religious force in France in the time of Voltaire. Uh, and that was one of the things that the French Revolution was about, was to try to break the uh, power of uh, the Catholic Church. So Voltaire waged a lifelong war against the Catholic Church. He was very critical of all religions, but especially mm -hmm. of the Catholic Church, because that was the one that affected him most directly, uh, because yeah. it was uh, the church that they had in France at the time where he lived. Uh, Voltaire himself was a deist. Mm -hmm. uh, as were probably most of the major Enlightenment thinkers. Uh, pretty much all of the founding fathers of the United States, for example, were deists. And deists don't believe in any of the major organized religions. They believe there's a God, but they think that God is just sort of manifested in all things rather mm -hmm. than being sort of a separate entity that looks down on things. Yeah. Um, okay, so despite all the irony, Voltaire sometimes um, counters optimism with a realism. So in contrast to Dr. Ralph, the female narrators and the Dutch slave in Suriname include harsh and graphic details in telling their stories. So these stories thus remind us of the great mismatch between realities of the 18th century and the life of the, uh, the, the life of the in the 18th century and what was really actually happening. Uh, and the philosophy of optimism. So there is a great disparity between uh, th the two. And so the Dutch slave in Suriname and his story and his mother uh, and uh, the owner of the slave and what he puts them through and all the suffering uh, is really similar, Professor Booker, to the story that you just mentioned, uh, Mother Courage, mm -hmm. and how this mom, this mother, just accepts that that fate of her son, um, regardless of like um, how painful and um, like you know the suffering that he undergoes, that is think that this is how things are supposed to be, right? Right, and I think this mismatch that you talk about here between reality and philosophy uh, is very much a part of the texture of life in the 18th century because the 18th century was the the uh, peak time of the Enlightenment. It's when rationality reigns supreme, when people are becoming very optimistic about mm -hmm. uh, the possibility of human beings to build a better life through rational thinking. But at the same time, it was also a time when none of this kind of thinking had ever really paid off. 
Mm -hmm. uh, there were a lot of wars. There were a lot of social problems, a lot of disease. I mean, one of the things that you can point to now that says, well, whatever you might say about modernity, one of the things it did bring was, for example, modern medicine, True. which has been one of the great booms in the history of human civilization. But in the 18th century, medicine essentially was almost typically did more harm than good. It was so poorly advanced. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the capitalism was becoming the dominant system, but it really wasn't doing a lot to create wealth uh, at the time because it was still in a very primitive state and the Industrial Revolution of, of the early 19th century hadn't taken place yet. And so they hadn't really started to uh, become productive in the way that capitalism ultimately would. Yeah. So they have all of these high-minded ideals, but none of them have ever really done anything yet to improve the texture of life for most people. True, that's true. And so now if we move to the trip to El Dorado um, um, with Candy, um, El Dorado is basically what represents utopia, right? It's a mythical city of gold in South America, long dreamt of by European explorers. Gold there is plentiful, so it's there, but it has little value. And so that um, gives you kind of uh, a commentary on the relative nature of uh, value. So, and uh, like I said, El Dorado serves as utopia, but it's an impossible, uh, it's an imp impossible utopia. Um, note the word utopia is derived from two Greek words um, that sound the same on the meaning. It, one of them, it means perfect place, the perfect place. And one of them means the no place. And this, uh, so this basically uh, suggests that the story, um, in the story that uh, El Dorado suggests that it is one thing to dream of a better world, but it's another, another thing to actualize it and to realize it. And this really reminds me of Ernst uh, Bloch, who is the, the most important or the single actually important utopian uh, thinker uh, uh, that when that talks about imagining ideal and utopian uh, societies and says that when you want to imagine an ideal society uh, uh, one needs to uh, uh, attempt to stretch uh, their mind to grasp that the notion that history is an ongoing process and that the not yet can be fundamentally different from the now. And thus, utopia is never achieved. It's not, it's not something that you can just achieve and say, khalas, that's it, I achieved it. But it's simply something that you seek, it is sought in a never ending uh, process. And so, uh, don't you agree, Professor Booker? Absolutely, mm -hmm. I think this whole El Dorado episode uh, is uh, making a very strong point about what you might call uh, the bad mode of utopian thinking. That is the idea where you just sit around and dream up something that would be fabulous and perfect, but don't really ever do anything to move toward that. Uh, and again, he uses that example of El Dorado, which the Spanish conquistadors mm -hmm. uh, dreamed of uh, back in the 16th century, mm -hmm. finding somewhere in South America. Uh, and, you know, first of all, he literalizes it because they, they, they envisioned El Dorado as a city made of gold. And as Voltaire points out, gold is only valuable because it's scarce. If the whole city's made of gold, then gold won't be valuable anymore, and so there won't be anything uh, marvelous about uh, being made of gold uh, anymore. But his real point is that uh, the kind of utopian thinking that, that he espouses and the kind that's really useful uh, doesn't involve imagining uh, you know, fairy tale lands where everything is perfect. It imagines getting down and doing the hard work of trying to build a better life for yourself and for other people. So it is actually right. stretching one's mind to imagine that you can do, but not just to imagine and sit. Imagination is still a very important part of it. Uh -huh. But instead of trying to imagine the details of a perfect society, uh, what Bloch recommends and what I think Voltaire would agree with is mm -hmm. what you need to just uh, imagine is that things could be better. Uh, and then just to continually work to make things better and make things better and always make things better. You'll never finish. You'll always be working to make things because better. Because the moment you think that you have reached that place, then it means that you failed. 
then you're going to stagnate, uh, and eventually, even if you're even if you reached an ideal state initially, mm-hmm. it wouldn't stay ideal because if you get stuck in that place, then you have no uh, because things are moving forward, and you're the only one who's stuck. You're, you're There's stuck. always going to be things that happen that you need to respond to, and you won't be able to respond to new things uh, if you're stuck in this stagnant society. True, and so now we. get to their last trip their concluding trip in turkey where candide and his fellow travelers end up uh, like i said in turkey in the center of an already declining ottoman um, uh, empire and actually uh, half a century later it was called by most european countries uh the um, uh, sick man of europe So the people in Turkey here were portrayed as being strong believers in faith. So their entire empire is falling apart and is getting dismantled. And they are yet, they passively accept what's happening because they consider it part of their faith. So this notion of passivity was a key element of uh, the study of Orientalism. Uh, The study of Orientalism is a set of stereotypes through which Europeans in the 18th century consistently viewed Asia and the Middle East as uh, outlined by the Palestinian-American Edward Said in 1978 in his book, Orientalism. Uh, Professor Booker, if you want to comment on that. Well, I I might start with the last line on your slide here. Uh Uh, For Said, these stereotypes uh, were basically part of a discourse that helped the West to exert power over the East during the colonial period, mostly in the 18th and 19th century, is what he's talking about. Uh, though he does point out that uh, Orientalist ideas uh, continue uh, in the West to this day. Mm-hmm. Uh, though, uh, as, uh, as you know, uh, being the co-author with me of a book called Consumerist Orientalism that mm-hmm. was recently published, mm-hmm. uh, there is a, a new form of Orientalism that has arisen since the beginning of the 20th century, along with the rise of consumer capitalism. Yeah. So basically, capitalism transformed itself in the course of the 20th century, and one of the parts of that transformation was the production of a new kind of Orientalism, which essentially uses Orientalist stereotypes uh, for marketing purposes rather than for colonialist purposes. Uh, but again, that's all uh, long after Candide. So in Candide's day, we'd still be talking about the kinds of Western stereotypes. And of course, Turkey is the ideal place uh, to focus on here because Turkey was the part of the Middle East that people in Europe knew the most about, had the most experience with. The Ottoman Empire had at one time extended well into uh, Europe, though. It, oh, it yeah, and we're basically commenting here on that, that um, uh, picture uh, of the um, of the adaptation. Yeah, if you think back to that picture, the, mm-hmm. the people in the East are pictured as being very exotic and mm-hmm. kind of romanticized. Mm-hmm. Uh, Exoticized. This co- really is a kind of companion story to the story of El Dorado, because yes. Turkey is also this mysterious, exotic place, uh, and they go there. But instead of, of encountering anything mysterious and exotic, uh, they just uh, encounter people that are just sort of mired in passivity and just sort of waiting for something good to happen, uh, and, which, again, is the way pe- people in the Middle East were typically portrayed in Orientalist discourse. So Voltaire... Uh, himself clearly has a lot of Orientalist ideas and doesn't entirely transcend that and really obviously didn't really know a whole lot about Turkey or the Middle East. He's just uh, repeating uh, kind of fairly largely uh, held stereotypes. And and if you notice, I mean, he's consistent in doing that Voltaire throughout the text with the Dutch slave in Suriname, with uh, the women and their uh, stories of um, uh, uh, suffering, their tales of suffering. And uh, so if you, I mean, actually my question here is that what's Voltaire's purpose of not showing actually these people grappling with their conditions of life and we're only presented with people who are passively accepting. So is that really just to show you an extreme uh, like uh, picture of how optimism really uh, looks like and how yeah, how I, I it operates. Can, 
it's part of that mode of satire where you, mm-hmm. you know you sort of exaggerate and, and come up with extreme examples uh, of everything. Mm-hmm. And since he knows that people in the Orient, if you will, were widely thought of in Europe as being passive and yeah, and I mean, like in a lot of Hollywood movies, life. for example, when there is like some bomb that's like you know gonna like hit everyone in the world and some disaster is gonna happen suddenly like you have like like p- pictures that are depicting people throughout the world and like people are just you know praying and sitting and praying and they just like you know feel that this is the only thing that they can they can do right and, like, yeah and, d- I, and i think though that part of voltaire's point here is to use this example of people in the middle east that are widely thought of as passive in mm-hmm. europe but in a subtle way to suggest that people in Europe are really just as passive. Exactly, that, that that's my point. That that it's not really that different, there. right? Exactly. Yeah. So, in a way, he's kind of being dialectic. He is being, in, as opposed to that polar opposition uh-huh. between Europe and the Middle East that you see in Orientalist thinking. So you're like, uh, there is really not that great disparity. If you really think about it, those people are really behaving in that same irrational way. According to Voltaire, I, I think what he hopes is that his readers will experience a sort of cognitive dissonance, True. and they'll see these people and they say, "Oh, those people are acting like uh, Orientals." We look at them, how foolish they are, and then suddenly they'll think, "Oh, wait a minute, I'm doing the same thing myself." True, uh, and, and so he's hoping actually that it's gonna like invoke in you that kind of cogn- cognitive dissonance, the, the good kind, the Brecht, the Brechtian kind, as opposed to just, you know, the one discussed by Franz Fanon, uh, where uh, when something comes against your um, uh, core uh, belief, a notion that goes against your core belief, what you do is that you just rationalize your core belief and you attack it in every way to uh, rationalize uh, your core belief and, dependent d- d- and defend it, sorry, because you just don't want to think that there is a flaw or a big flaw over here, right? But then there is the cognitive dissonance uh, that leads to a positive results, hopefully, that Brecht talks about. Um, so it deals with the form of cognitive dissonance that can lead to a positive reassessment of one's attitude and opi- uh, attitudes and opinions. And so when you're reading, the, the European readers are reading about those people in Turkey and they say, like, what's wrong with those people? And why are they being passive? In accepting their fate, they're like, wait a minute, like you said, I'm doing the exact same thing. Right? Yeah, and that, that can be very powerful, but of course it's a risky strategy mm-hmm. because it's, it's always possible that people won't recognize that. True, true. That is also true. Um, okay, so... Sa- on uh, Candide, um, uh, Professor Booker, if you just tell us a little bit on textuality and like the attack here on textuality and the irony in this. Well, I think since we've been talking about Orientalism in Candide, uh, it's worth pointing out that Said in his book Orientalism does in fact uh, mention Candide. Uh, and, uh, but he, he mentions it really not as an example of bad Orientalism, but as an example of, uh, of what he calls an attack on textualism. And so he agrees with Voltaire in this sense, and he sees he presents Voltaire in a very positive way. Mm-hmm. And, and the idea of textualism is basically just uh, learning about the world only through books or texts, uh, understanding the world only through books. Uh, Said obviously was a very eminent scholar, and, and he's a big believer in books, but he doesn't think you can just learn about the world through books. And mm-hmm. so uh, his argument is... Uh, that it has to do with Orientalism. The idea is that the, the reason why people had such naive ideas about the Middle East is because most of the people only know what they read about it in books. They've so never can we also it. argue that it really depends on your source of information? It's really not only that you shouldn't depend on books. It's like what kind of books that you're exposed to? Obviously, some books are, are going to be more useful than others, uh, for sure. But but I think Said w- would argue that you can never uh, understand the world fully through any book, regardless of how good the book is, whether it's Marx or whoever. Uh, you still need to have some real experience uh, of the world. Uh, and uh, But again, books are useful. Do so you I mean, agree Saeed with this logic? Are, 
Uh, yeah, of course I agree with it. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's clear that uh, books can tell us a great deal about the world, and they're probably uh, our most important single source of information. Uh, especially about the past, because we can't experience. The but past. I think my point, my point here is that what if you're a person who lives in an enclosed community? I mean, how good is it gonna do you if you're exposed to your community, your like, your boundaries, and you're you're not even like going outside of that. So what's well, the difference? Uh, in a way, be? there are very few communities like that anymore. Of course, in the age of globalization, you know, we're all watching Netflix True. and we're all seeing a lot of the same things. Yeah. Uh, so uh, those, they're the kinds of uh, experience that we have in the world are becoming more and more uh, global uh, rather than isolated. Mm -hmm. But obviously, when you talk about experience of the world, that also means literally of the world. You know, if you only have one tiny, narrow, little experience of one kind of, of doing things then you really don't understand the world you only understand that one little tiny part of it so True. you need a, as broad an experience as possible uh in the world but you also need to read as many books as possible the point is that you know Said isn't saying oh my god don't read books don't listen to books he's saying just don't only depend on books uh, books are great uh, read as many books as you possibly can but don't do it to the exclusion uh, of having any actual experience uh, of the world. Yeah, and again, yeah. just like also going back to the point, do not believe everything you read. And you have to do read not everything. Do not take it at face value. Mm -hmm. You have to interrogate the things you read and ask yourself whether they're uh, really valid. And that's one of the reasons why it's important to read lots of different things. True. Uh, so that you can compare them with one another. True. And so... In the end, like in concluding this tale, um, Candide reaches a place where he realizes that what is best to do is to tend your own garden. Is because, uh, and, and we're going to discuss uh, this um, quotation and what it means and what it entails, but if we go throughout Candide's um, journey, Professor Booker, and what he encountered, so he went through different phases, right? Um, he travels to all kinds of different places, and the the point, of course, is he's trying to discover, uh, you know, the ideal world. He's mm -hmm. trying to discover the truth of things. Uh, he thinks that he's going to just find a better life, uh, and by saying tend your own garden, of course, Voltaire says, no, you can't just find a better life. You have to make a better life. Make a better uh, life, and I think it also, like, when he first, like, begins his journey and his travels, he really starts off with a certain notion and idea that he wants to support, that he supports it. And so um, he doesn't enter these journeys thinking, okay, I don't know what I'm going to encounter and I'll see what's going to happen and how I'm going to form my opinions, right? He already have a formed opinion at the beginning, which is the philosophy of optimism, right? Correct. And that he was a believer of that philosophy and then now throughout the journey and these um, encounters with the people and their sufferings makes him um, uh, completely change his mind and have a total um, uh, change in his perspective, like where he reaches a complete rejection, right? Now he understands, uh, again, that you have to really work uh, to try to build a better life for yourself. And then ultimately he moves from that, exactly, he, rem he also moves away from that total rejection into the idea of tending your own garden where you need to work at making things uh, better and you cannot just have the imagination part and that you shouldn't also be naive. There are things that happen in the world and there are great atrocities and traumatic experiences that happen in this world and that shouldn't also lead you to quietism, right? It shouldn't lead you to say, exactly. okay, fact, the world... The, the fact that there are so many bad things uh, is all the more reason why you should be working to make things better. You mm. can't uh, you just sit and say, well, hopefully it'll, it'll get better. Uh, because it doesn't seem to be happening. You know, People really need to be working hard to make things better. True. And part of that <laughs> is realizing that... So you don't turn a blind eye 
on the atrocities that are happening in the world, but also you shouldn't have a kind of naive vision of thinking that you as a person can fix the entire world, right? And so that ultimately, when you think, when you face the world with what Candide um, you know, thought at the beginning that I can fix the entire world and he realized that he couldn't, it would re lead you to being depressed and then ultimately it would lead you to despair and like, I don't want to do anything. So ultimately you just have to think about how you can solve one problem at a time and that you should probably start with yourself and not think of magical solutions, thinking of realist solutions to help, uh, to help out, right? Right, tend your own garden is uh, what they sometimes call a small steps approach. You, know, you have to make small steps. You can't just fix all the problems of the world at once and create this perfect society. But if you just keep working and keep going and do your best and be a good person and work hard and try to help other people, eventually the next thing you know, maybe things will be a little bit better. And then after that, maybe they'll be a little bit better than that. And if people keep working and working and working, they'll continue to make progress. Yeah, that's very true. Um, yeah, and so that is the end of our discussion on Candide. Uh, would you like to add anything, Professor Booker? Uh, no, I think uh, you covered it very well. Uh, I'd just like to say that uh, I enjoyed uh, talking with you, and I'm glad thank you, you invited me. Thank, thank you so much for being uh, with me uh, here today in, discuss in discussing uh, Candide. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Okay, bye.